All right, we're live. This is our first ever responder talk ever recorded. Uh, two years has been a hell of a journey. I think everyone who uh, has been part of the Rep for Responders family, who's been on the responder talk calls, who's helped save my life and helped me stay sober. I appreciate you all. So good evening. My name is Frank, the founder of Rep for Responders nonprofit, and I'm an active law enforcement officer in the city of New York. Responder Talk is ran every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern, which is our topic or speaker meeting via Zoom. This group is strictly for first responders, military, active or retired. First responder personnel includes law enforcement officer, firefighter, EMS, EMT, corrections, nurses, police dispatchers, and military personnel. Please, whatever you hear here, let it stay here. This is a safe haven for us. I encourage everyone to state what department they are in or work for. This shows we are all over the country and we're in this together. If you know anyone who would be interested in joining Responder Talk, please let me know. Responder Talk covers topics such as wellness, nutrition, fitness, and recovery. Recovery is not defined as just substance abuse. Recovery is an everyday practice of working on yourself to make yourself a better you. You can be in recovery from substance abuse, trauma, anxiety, depression, relationship difficulties, and so on. Here in Responder Talk, we hope you feel comfortable enough talking about your life experiences and sharing them with first responders from all over the country. And with that, welcome to Responder Talk. This will be on Inside the Labyrinth podcast. Uh, we have our rep for responders, building resiliency and conquering the job on Amazon. Uh, for everyone in the Northeast area, we have a big beefsteak fundraiser coming up April 15th. And for everyone who support rep for responders, thank you. Now enough out of me, because we know that I can speak and people are gonna fall, fall asleep. And uh, I don't have the mustache, so you can't make fun of me tonight, Steve. Uh, but tonight, we have the honor, the privilege for Dr. Christopher Palmer, the author of the book Brain Energy that I'm going to put into the chat. And uh, we had a wonderful conversation before this. Uh, Dr. Palmer, thank you so much for being here, uh, for supporting our mission. And uh, just thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Frank, for inviting me. And uh, it's actually kind of an honor to be here to serve, to if I can do something to serve all of you who serve all of us and save our lives every day and put your lives on the line, I am more than happy to do whatever I can. Well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate those kind words. Um, so we'll get right into question number one. Doc, just a little bit about yourself, how long you've been practicing for, um, where maybe a little bit about where you grew up or where you're located now and really why brain energy? So uh, uh, I grew up in the Midwest in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, ended up going to college at Purdue, went to med school in St. Louis and ended up coming out to Boston to do my residency at Harvard. And I've been here ever since. So I am a psychiatrist for over 27 years now. Um, and uh, um, do all sorts of things. So, you know, over that 27 year period, I have always had a clinical practice, um, usually with patients with treatment resistant mental illness. So I don't, I don't treat people off the street with their first episode of depression or anxiety. Um, or even schizophrenia, really. Usually I, I treat people after they've been through multiple kind of psychiatrists and mental health professionals in and out of hospitals. I've done neuroscience research. And uh, nowadays, my you know for the last 20 years or so, my day job is I'm the director of education um, at the Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, the uh, kind of a side gig a hobby for me has always been thinking about and looking about looking at the effects of diet, exercise, and other lifestyle strategies on mental illness. In particular, I am really focused on the effects in serious mental illness. So these patients that I serve, treatment-resistant bipolar disorder, treatment-resistant chronic unrelenting depression and suicidality, Everybody knows diet and exercise. Well, yeah, you'll feel a little better. Oh, it's good for you. Sure, why not? I'm talking about using diet and exercise and things like that to treat people with crippling, supposedly lifelong, untreatable mental disorders. 
Um, I can sure as hell help people who have a little mild anxiety and I can help everybody in between too. But, um, and, and I think that, you know, the, the quick story of how I got to brain energy is that um, I had been using dietary strategies and I've been using exercise, you know, prescribing exercise to my patients, you know, decades. Um, and for some people, it made a huge difference. Not for everybody, though. And the thing that really was the game changer for me was when I helped a patient of mine with schizoaffective disorder, which is a class between schizophrenia and bipolar. I, I He wanted to help losing weight, put him on a ketogenic diet to help him lose weight. And the short story is he ended up having a miraculous recovery. Um, his hallucinations and delusions started going away within about two to three months. Um, he regained the ability to go out in public and not be paranoid. He um, ended up losing 160 pounds and has kept it off to this day, six years later, um, but was able to move out of his father's home for a time, was able to perform improv in front of a live audience, he was able to do things that really on paper are impossible for somebody with chronic schizophrenia to be able to do. And he'd had his schizophrenia for 10 years. He'd had mental illness since he was five. He'd been on medication since he was five. And that kind of threw everything that I knew as a psychiatrist out the window. Because I was like, this is impossible. A diet for schizophrenia, bipolar, like that, that that's not supposed to happen. The quick story, I'm, I keep saying quick story and I realize I'm not a quick story. <laughs> I'm going to give you a run for your money, Frank. <laughs> but, oh, man. Uh, <laughs> um, the end of the day, I ended up going on this deep dive, treating dozens, dozens more patients. And now I'm now aware of over 100 patients who have put their bipolar, chronic depression, or schizophrenia into remission, sometimes off medication, using diet, exercise, and other strategies. But I didn't stop there. I went on a much deeper dive into the science, try to understand what the hell's going on. Like this mental illness is, these are supposed to be permanent lifelong disorders chemical imbalances in your brain. These people are getting off their pills. Like, how the hell is this happening? What's going on? And that led to me writing this book called Brain Energy, which is really a, it's ridiculously audacious of me to put it forward. But I'm basically, in a nutshell, saying at the end of the day, when you look at all of the science, over a century of science that we have accumulated in the mental health field. The bottom line is that mental disorders are metabolic disorders of the brain. And in the same way that diet, exercise, stress, sleep, drugs and alcohol can cause somebody to have a heart attack, in that exact same way, all those things can cause somebody's brain to malfunction. And when that happens, we call that a mental illness. And much more importantly, we can use strategies like that in the ways that I just described to help people recover from mental illness. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. Thank you for uh, being so brave and you know sharing your your experience of you know kind of helping one. And and again, this in this group. Half of the half of the first responders are in recovery. The other half are just trying to make it through the job, or they already have made it through the job. And you know, just I always say that everyone has a story, and everyone's story is very important. But it's just up to us if we're going to share that story or make it into a book, right? Or make it an, or create a film about it. So thank you for for sharing that and uh, really starting to really make the movement to, to, to change the game. So I appreciate it. And that's going to lead me now into question number one or question number two. And that's going to be on alcohol. What we just, uh, the devil juice, rat poison, whatever you guys want to call it. Um, 
alcohol is a major, major, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a major potion in the first responder culture. So we hear a lot that, I don't know, maybe, you know, I don't want to eat uh, first responders say, oh, I have one or two. We know that's out the window. So let's just say hypothetically, and I'm going to speak from me, you know, I'm in recovery. I had three to five drinks a week. Okay. Three to five drinks a week doesn't sound like a lot, but in the month span, that could be the 20, 12 to 20 drinks a month. Basically going to the mentality of I deserve the drink because I just work so hard. I'm stressed, that mentality. And we're not talking about cops that are diagnosed with alcohol use disorder or physically addicted. We're just saying we're right now we're talking about three to five drinks a week. We know alcohol is a depressant. We know it kills testosterone. We know that it keeps carbs and fats. They're kept in storage. We know that it is the only substance, and correct me if I'm wrong, not the only, one of the only substances that is water and fat soluble for the cell that goes directly into the cell, okay? It's just very dangerous. Metabolically speaking, that 20 drink in a month period, is that really a big deal? Is it not? Could that lead to things down the road metabolically? Kind of what's your... Uh, perspective on a three to five drink. And that's, we're, we're really low ball here, doc, a week. So the, if you're really talking the technical term, three, like if we're, if we're going on the low end of that, three drinks, and we're really talking, you know, 12 ounce beer is three drinks. Five ounces of wine is one, is one drink. So 12 ounce beer is a drink, you know, uh, and very little, you know, um, hard liquor. When people drink hard liquor, they almost never just have one drink, technically. They're usually, if you pour yourself a martini or whiskey or something, you're usually pouring yourself at least three or four drinks um, uh, in one glass. Um, and if you get a big glass, you're pouring double that. Stuff. So, um, but if we're really talking that, the the bottom line is that I'll I'll try to stick as much to the facts as I can. Bottom line is that alcohol is a toxin to these tiny things in our cells called mitochondria. Um, mitochondria are basically what most people have heard of them as the powerhouse of the cell. Turns out over the last 20 years, we've had an explosion of cutting edge research in the medical field that tells us they are a lot more than that. Um, they actually control hormone production. They control neurotransmitter production and regulation. They control inflammation. They control um, actually the expression of genes in most of our cells. We do all sorts of things. So you can think of mitochondria as like these little workers inside cells and they're like running, they actually move around cells, they do all sorts of shit. So they're moving around cells, working like, working their asses off, trying to keep up, trying to keep the cell in good shape, do everything it needs to do. When you, when you drink alcohol, the alcohol gets converted into a molecule called acid aldehyde and it, that is poisonous to mitochondria. Um, so you're never ever doing yourself a favor by drinking a little. And for a long time, we heard that having one or two drinks a day was good for you. Um, and we, you know, people, we we heard red wine is good for you. It's got you know that anti-aging resveratrol thing in it, and uh, that's supposed to be good for you. Or maybe maybe having a little bit of wine will you relax. The studies that have come out over the last few years, they've reanalyzed a lot of those studies and figured out, oops, wait, wait that's probably not right. Um, it looks like alcohol in any amount is probably not good for you. There are still some experts who will say, yeah, I, I don't buy that. I'm not gonna change. I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not believing that. I'll, I'm still gonna stick with one, one or two drinks a day isn't terrible. Um, so I will tell you, experts will debate this. There will still be experts who will say one or two drinks a day, probably not harm that bad for you. I would argue though that uh, at best, you're not doing yourself any favor with alcohol, especially if 
you are in the stressful position, you know, kind of profession that you guys are in, it is way too easy to go down that slippery slope. You, if you start drinking on a regular basis, your, your brain and your body get used to that amount of alcohol. And then when you have a really shitty day, you're going to need more. And, and then if the shitty days kind of add up close together, you're going to need even more. And then, you know, three to five a week is going to turn into five to 10 a week is going to turn into 15, to 20 a week. And like Frank said, you're going to feel like I deserve this. I'm working my ass off. I'm seeing shit that other people aren't seeing. They don't have to deal with what I have to deal with. I, I deserve this. And how the hell else am I going to stop my thoughts? If everybody else can stop it and deal with it, oh, good for them. Well, I'm not that, I'm not that strong. I just need to shut this shit off. I just need to stop this stuff in my head. I, I can't think about this right now. I'm not going to be able to go to sleep if I don't cut these thoughts out. And the easiest way to do that is to drink. Um, and then before you know it, you're going to be meeting criteria for alcohol use disorder. And now you're really trashing your brain. You're trashing your liver. The challenge, though, is that when you're trashing your brain metabolically, you're actually making everything worse. Your anxiety next week is going to be even worse because you're drinking. The depression next week is going to be even worse than it is this week simply because of the alcohol. It won't feel that way, though. It'll feel like, no, I'm, I'm dealing with city stuff. I'm seeing bad stuff in my shift, or I'm dealing with boredom, or I'm dealing with relationship problems, or I'm dealing with financial problems. You'll come up with all sorts of good reasons about why you deserve to be stressed and why you're justified in being stressed. And it will feel normal and natural. But what I'm telling you is that all of the research that we know some large studies, talking to thousands of people who've been down this road, all the way down to cell biology. If you, I'm kind of a nerd in that way. So if you get down to cell biology, I can explain to you biologically how and why drinking a lot is going to make your anxiety even worse next week. Um, but that's the bottom line. And then you're trapped. Once you get in that, now you're trapped. And uh, and it is a horrible hole to try to pull yourself out of. Thank you. Yeah, it was what we call it, right? You're then you're in the labyrinth, and now the minotaur is breathing down your neck. And uh, what do you do next, right? Uh, thank you for a very in depth uh, answer for that. I think that's uh, that's very powerful, and that that really helped me out. So thank you. Uh, it's going to lead, I'm actually going to do like a second point uh, part question to that. Um, Cause you, you, you got my, you got my little, my little brain firing away here. Okay. Um, let's talk about, let's mix a little bit about alcohol and lower carbohydrate. Let's, let's just go, right. Like we're not going to explain to the whole group, the whole differences. When we say keto tonight, guys, let's just say like uh, there's ketones in our body. If we say lower carb tonight, let's just say like 100 grams or lower. OK, um, so I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis in 2014, and I had some pretty brutal symptoms that kind of just would come and go. It wasn't every day. Um, and then I, through the grace of God, I decided to stop drinking in 2019. And I went for a colonoscopy uh, two weeks ago. And the the doctor said, your, your colitis is gone. What did you do? And you're going to laugh at this. Okay. <laughs> so when I let, when I stopped drinking, I started picking up another bad habit and I, and I started to, which I don't do tobacco anymore, but I started to dip. Okay. And I told him I've been on and off here and there. And I said, he said, yeah, there's studies that show that nicotine helps ulcerative colitis. So I said, you're telling me that since I haven't drank since 2019, that I've been watching when I'm eating, that I'm in the gym religiously five to six uh, times a week, that I go to meetings, that I do meditation, and that doesn't help. I'm really just going to go with the nicotine. So what I'm saying here is let's go to autoimmune disease this year. Because out of nowhere, I just got diagnosed with alopecia. 
and I got the cortisol shot, okay? Not drinking a lower carbohydrate diet, allergies, okay? I was on, uh, I took allergy pill my whole life. I was allergic to a lot of spring allergies, dogs, uh, chocolate, peanut butter. As I got older, I grew out of it, but they wanted to keep me on the Zyrtec and the Singulair, basically. And I just stopped taking it when I was in 2019. I said, I don't want to take any medication with Dr. Palmer, what I opened up to you before about, right? I just wanted to do this as natural as I can. And the only time I had an asthma attack really was when I was diagnosed with COVID since then. That's it. Lower carbohydrate diet and autoimmune disease, and of course, staying from alcohol. Um, have you ever had any experience with that or any studies or research with that? Oh, yeah. No. So low carb diet, um, whether it, you know, depends on how low you go and whether it's ketogenic or not, but we have a lot of evidence actually that um, ketogenic diets in particular, or just lowering carbohydrates, getting rid of a lot of the processed foods will decrease inflammation. Um, and clearly what you had was an, a, a disorder of your immune system causing higher levels of inflammation. So, um, you know, in terms of officially treating things like um, colitis uh, or even chronic Lyme disease, there are tons of people out there um, who, you know, anecdotal reports will say, I cured my chronic Lyme, I cured this by going on a low carb or ketogenic diet. We have animal models showing that it is highly anti-inflammatory. We have human data actually in a study of alcoholics. Ketogenic diet decreases brain inflammation. That was done by the federal government, um, uh, by the National Institutes of Health. So we have um, lots of reason to believe it's anti-inflammatory. And my guess is that, that is probably what it did for you. The unfortunate news is that it may not be a cure for you. I'll just tell you that up front. Sometimes it can reset everything and maybe this, your system kind of rebalances. But for a lot of people, more often than not, if you go back to a shitty diet, especially if you go back to a shitty diet and start drinking alcohol again, it, all those things may come. The inflammatory conditions may come back. The colitis may even come back. Um, so. In that way, you can't necessarily call it a quote unquote cure. The cure would be like, you know, you take an antibiotic and then it doesn't matter what you do after that. The bacteria is not coming back because you've killed it. You've killed all of it. Um, and, uh, and, but if you follow your plan, there's a good chance it's not going to come back. It's just stay away. Thank you. Thank you for that knowledge. Because <clears throat> I know a lot of first responders that, uh, especially with the you know stress and develop uh, if it's IBS or or just gut health in general and uh, there's not really any education and you speak to your primary GI and it's like oh well we don't really know the cause so here's Lealda or excuse my language here's a, a suppository put it somewhere that you don't want to put it and move on so um, thank you for uh, clearing up that uh, going into question uh, number three point five now. Uh, we're going to get into something that I know you enjoyed um, to speak about obesity. And let's let's even say 20 to 30 pounds over overweight, okay? So there was a 2014 study that estimated, this is 2014, that about, and in 2014, the obesity rate, the study said for the, for the civilian population was like 37 or 38%, okay? We, I think, uh, we have, what are we up to, Dr. Palmer? 50% of the United States is possibly obese in 2023 or around there? Not yet. I think we're still at like, I'm not sure of the latest numbers because the pandemic actually took a toll. The pandemic made everything worse. Um, but we were, we're at 70 to 80% of all Americans qualify for overweight or obese. And uh, the latest numbers, at least that I saw, they may not be the most accurate. But the latest ones that I saw were about, I think, 40-ish percent range for obesity itself. Okay, so that's... Um, but they're projected to keep going up. There, there's, there's no end in sight. So 2014, they have 40.5% of police, police officers were obese. 
and let's just say overweight. Let's use the, let's use the word overweight here. Yeah. So my question to you is, why do you think it is? Is it because cops don't care and they get sucked into work and I don't have enough time mentality? Or is this really something bigger than that? Uh, and, and how does this really play hand in hand with, with mental illness? Okay. So, yeah, two huge questions. So we know from large studies that people with obesity have anywhere from 25 to 75% higher rates of mental illness. Um, it depends on what study you look at and what kind of illness we're talking about. Um, but 25 to 75% higher rates. So I wanna just make the point, you can have a mental illness and be sick. You can have a mental illness and be physically, you can have ripped abs and still have a mental illness. You can also be obese and be perfectly mentally healthy. So these things aren't one-to-one -one relationships. That you know, it's obvious, and I just want to go on the record as like saying I, I I get that, I know that. I'm not trying to defy common sense, um, but there is a relationship between them, and it goes. You know, it's most commonly for anxiety and depression. People who have obesity are more likely to have anxiety and depression. One of the biggest theories out there is that it's all about fat shaming. It's all about, well, you know, wouldn't you be depressed and anxious if you were fat because everybody's making fun of you? Um, or if you're young and trying to date, you know, you can't get dates um, as easily. Or maybe you're experiencing job discrimination. And that's why people are having it. I actually think it's much deeper than that. I think it's biological. And the reason is because people with obesity who have bipolar disorder are much more likely to have bipolar episodes. They're more likely to have manic episodes and depressive episodes. And, um, and that suggests like you don't get manic because of, you know, necessarily because people are fat shaming you or whatever. We usually don't say that. Um, and you certainly don't get psychotic because people are fat shaming you supposedly. And so, you know, obesity is associated with higher rates of inflammation that can affect your brain. There are all sorts of other biological mechanisms I could go into, but I'll just leave it at the bottom line. People with obesity are putting their brain health at risk. That's the bottom line. Um, and in terms of police officers in particular, Time Magazine did an article in the last 10 years, they surveyed all professions to see which profession had the highest rates of obesity. And unfortunately, for those of you who are cops, cops were number one. Cops got the number one distinction of having the highest rates of obesity. Some of the reasons they outlined um, are, you know, obviously the stress from the job, we can talk maybe a little more about that. How does stress lead to obesity? But it does. Um, but if you're sitting in a squad car most of the day, driving around, you're sitting. So you're sitting a lot, not moving. You're usually stuck eating fast food. You got to get in, get out, eat crappy food. Cops often are working shifts, not always a consistent same shift. So if you're doing any kind of shift work, if you're doing any kind of overtime work, if you're working night, if you're not, if you don't have a regular sleep and wake time, if you're not going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time every day because you're out working or you're really stressed or you're going out drinking, trying to numb the thoughts or whatever, um, or just hang out, um, all of those things contribute to obesity. So I think there are lots of reasons and they're going to be different for different people, but all of those things seem to play a role. Thank you. Um, leading into let's let's talk about that that stress. Um, 
one of I mean, you know Greenies in here, uh, Dr. Kevin Gilmartin. He wrote the book, uh, Multiple Survival Guide for Law Enforcement, um, a guide for officers and their families, and talks about the the donut theory. Right, is that when you see a cop, and he talks about when you see a really good cop, and they have a big stomach, and the rest of their body is kind of like pro, like uh, equally portion size, right? And that it's not that they eat so much donuts is that it's the stress from the shift work, the hypervigilance, the, uh, the adrenaline getting released, and then the cortisol coming down. And, and now, you know, being back on the street and just being aware of being aware, I call it, I can feel, uh, I wish I could like just look at it through like a movie. I can feel when it's happening. Like, okay, I know that's, that's the adrenaline coming in. I know when it's going to kick it back down. And, and it's not, how do I say this? It, it is built inside of us for a reason. But I think over a certain amount of time when that is happening weekly, daily, um, I don't think that that's good or we need to do something to combat that. And that's what we talk about in this group of if it's meditation, if it's working out, if it's eating right for eating healthy and eating healthy doesn't mean everyone's different. Like Dr. Palmer said, is that one, whoever's listening and we talk about this group, please, please, please get your blood work checked, get your metabolic panel, get your testosterone levels checked, get your vitamin E. Just a lot of cops, we can, we have it for free and they don't do it for years and years. Um, so let's, I guess let's talk about that stress and how does stress really relate to weight gain? Um, and then we, we just talked about what that weight gain can, can do. I, I, I could talk about this forever. Um, so tons of research on s stress causing all sorts of mental health and metabolic health problems combined. And it doesn't matter when the stress is. So if you look at kids who have fitty childhoods, they get beaten up, they're being molested, they're being bullied and teased, parents, are in jail, parents are using drugs, parents are mentally ill. Um, those are all adverse childhood experiences. The, the more you have, the worse your health, both your mental health and your metabolic health. Kids who have six or more of them, one study found on average, they live 20 years shorter lives than people who have none of that stuff. So stress from a young age starts taking a toll. We know that people who put themselves in danger, um, soldiers, first responders, and others, um, as you said, it's not that the stress is pathological. The stress is saving your life. If somebody's coming at you, or if you're looking at a situation and you're thinking like this could go bad really bad, like I don't, I don't know what's going to happen here. You need to be having stress. You need to hear pin drop. You need to hear somebody opening a door. You, you need to be on super high alert. That is not pathological. That is your brain trying to save your ass. It's all good. You'll be dead really fast if you try to make that go away in that moment. Making that go away when you're in a dangerous situation is not at all the goal. The challenge is that you are taking a toll on your brain and your body when you go through that. And the more you go through that, the more of a toll you are taking on your body. The way I, you know, one comparison of this is like, and, and then we can even get into how it can cause what I would call disorders. So if you're having a panic attack or if you're having stress reaction, hypervigilance out in the field when you're in a dangerous situation, that's, I, I'm never going to say that's pathological. That's, again, that's good. But, you know, really easy example. I'm going to use, I'm going to switch to a totally different topic. Two cars. You have a car that's well-maintained, that's never in a blizzard, 
that, you know, is driving on really good roads all the time. Car is going to live a really nice long life. It's got an easy life. You have another car that's going through mountains and potholes and blizzards and salt and shit. Well, and it's got its windshield wipers going and its blinkers on and brakes all the time, everything else. All of those things that that car is doing are trying to save that car's ass in that blizzard and the shitty weather and the shitty road conditions. But guess what? That car is not going to live as long as the easygoing car that's got the nice life that, that, that's riding, you know, that's never facing any kind of bad weather, that never has salt on it. That, so I liken it to the same deal. If we're going to compare first responders, military personnel who are going through blizzards, who are getting salt all over them, who are just, they're, they're facing life-threatening situations. And they have to respond to those. All of those situations are taking a toll. There is no way around it. And no matter what you do in the off time, if you are also getting abused or if you are also having financial problems or if your spouse is divorcing you or if, you know, if you've got shitty parents who just rag on you, like whatever is going, whatever else is going on, it's going to be really hard for that person to live the same healthy life that some compared to somebody else who's got an easy life, who's not putting themselves in the harm way. Nonetheless, there are a lot of things you can do to protect yourself and take care of yourself and honor yourself and live the best life you can. Um, and that means when you're not in those dangerous situations, the more that you can do to turn that stress response off, the better. When you're not in those, and that can be exercise, it could be meditation or mindfulness, can be all sorts of things. And I want to just caution, I get the temptation to drink alcohol to turn it off. I get the temptation to smoke a little weed to turn it off. Smoking weed, hey, that's legal now, so it must be good for you, right? No, I'm here to tell you it ain't good for your brain. I'm sorry. Those things are quick fixes. They'll turn off your stress response. They will make you feel better in the moment, but unfortunately, they are actually causing even more harm and damage. So, um, so it's tricky. I'll uh, I'll stop it. Oh no, that was that was excellent. That was a gem. Uh, I'm gonna you're gonna have to patent that, and uh, that's probably be the one of the videos we post on our page. Uh, the the car <laughs> reference that was great. <laughs> Um, so that leads into feeling burnt. It's in the beginning of the, the first section of your book, burnout and, and major depressive disorder. Let's go into major depressive disorder, uh, picking on it because I was diagnosed with that. Um, we're going to do a little New York City police. Uh, I can't even say that. Let's just do a little police uh, academy scenario, you and me. Okay. This is going to be your first ever scenario here, Doc, as a, as a doctor for a police department. And I'm the officer. Um, first things first, can you clear the air for me? Uh, major depressive disorder. What you said three to four months in your book and, and on a lot of interviews that it just kind of goes into remission on its own. Is that true? Okay. Yeah. So leading into this. So I was shocked, shocked because I probably suffered for that for about a year and a half. Um, about, let's just say a year from that. Um, I'm the officer. And I am diagnosed with major depressive disorder, but I'm too afraid to tell my department that I have major depressive disorder because, you know, I'm going to get my gun and shield taken away. My life is over. So I have to, I can't do that because if I lose my gun and shield, my career is over. I'm done. Um, that's just not an option. So what would you tell that officer that is 
clinically, you know, that you clinically diagnose. And let's go with the let's go with the scenario that you're an outside uh, doctor. You're not a police um, doctor yet, because we're going to have another question for that. And the cop just keeps showing up in the stressful environment and just keeps showing up with major depressive disorder. Um, kind of what what would you say to them? Would you tell them to get help? Would you recommend any type of medication? Would you recommend small type of try to change behaviors if they even have the energy to kind of this is a really real life situation that happens all the time across the country so knowing what i know now i would want to know more about how that person perceives their depression i would ask a really common sense question i would say why are you depressed and depending on the answer that person gives me, I'm probably going to recommend different types of treatment. So if the person says I'm depressed because my wife is about to leave me, she thinks I drink too much, she, she thinks I'm irritable when I come home from, uh, from work, um, and I don't know what the fuck to do, then I'm going to probably recommend that, that person go to counseling. Um, and counseling to start could be helpful. Um, you know, I'm going to put out there right up front right now, you know, just, uh, just today I came across an, a global article. What is the first line treatment for depression? There are two first line treatments for depression across the board without even knowing anything about the person. Two first line treatments, either an antidepressant or therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. So either go to a therapist and try that or start an antidepressant. You read the book, Frank, so I'm gonna tell people, I'm a little skeptical to just automatically put people on meds nowadays. And I'm gonna look for other strategies that might result in longer term success. Um, and some people, can have bad reactions to med. Meds can be life-saving for some people, no doubt about it. And for anyone who's tried them, if they're working for you, great. I'm not here to take them away. But you know, I would I would go through a lot of other assessments. I would want to know what's your diet like? How much are you drinking? Are you smoking weed? How's your sleep? Um how do you manage your stress when you finish your work? How stressful is work? I mean, if this person is going through a shit blizzard every single day and I'm just hearing about, oh my God, they just sent me to this new neighborhood. The crime is a shit show. I'm seeing kids bloody from, you know, whatever. I'm seeing sexual abuse cases. I'm, it's just nonstop. It's nonstop horror shit show. You'd be like, well, how could you not be? <laughs> like, how, like, of course, you're like, really? I've, and, and the solution for that person, so this person is walking through a blizzard of hell. They're walking through a blizzard of hell. My solution for them is not an antidepressant. An antidepressant is not going to do a whole lot for that person. If it does, I'm worried it may actually do something bad because that person's putting them, their life in danger every day. There's a reason they are so burned out and fried and stressed. And I'm gonna wanna address that. And, and at some point I may have a conversation with this person and just say, look, like you're, you know, you're in this career for the long haul. You cannot keep doing what you're doing right now because it's, it's you know, it's kind of like the cars in the blizzard getting torn apart and now you got a flat tire you can't just keep going you can't just keep driving in the blizzard you need to stop and change your fucking tire you need to stop and do a little maintenance work you need to stop every now and then and get gas and and if you're going through this hell of a blizzard and there's no end in sight, you may need to have a talk with your department, somebody, colleague, and say, look, I can't keep this shit up right now. I, if anything that can be done, 
to like give me a little relief and we send somebody else in my place can i switch with something i don't know what all the th options are you guys all know better than me but but it would it would be along those lines that like i'm gonna burn out i'm not gonna make it um this again it's like this is a I'm running a marathon i'm falling apart i need to stop i need to rest i need to drink some water i, I need some recovery time Oh, this is perfect because this is going to lead into the next question and we're 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 on it. So now the scenario is that that officer, myself, finally says, okay, I'm going to put up the white flag. I'm going to surrender to this scenario, to the situation. And now I approach you, which is you're the head psychiatrist or psychologist for a police department. Okay. And um, the way I want to word this is that if you were the head, which I just stated, um, how long so what what usually happens is that if they come if you come forward i can't speak for all departments that you'll get removed to like a desk duty okay so you'll be out of that stressful environment um and you'll do the rubber gun squad right and now there's different ways of treatment where i know that i know a first responder inpatient facility in arizona that you don't have to have a substance abuse uh, uh, substance disorder to go. You just need to have PTSD or a major depressive disorder. So how long, because departments have to really have a cutoff time, how long would you see this, this officer um, or myself before you make a decision? Because of the time frame, right? And I know it's, it's very hard because everybody is different. Um, I say this because a lot of departments allow this to happen, um, but they kind of they kind of like are no one wants to make a decision, right? Because they're afraid of the ultimate choice. Unfortunately, and what we talked about, you already talked about OBC being the highest in police officers and first responders. Unfortunately, they they take their own lives. The first number one way that officers lose their life is the heart attack. Number two is lose their life to suicide. So, do you believe? that a department can implement a raise your hand protocol. Uh, and if treatment is successful and the doctor, okay, signs off on the treatment that the officer um, is good to go back out on the street or they are broken toy forever and, and, and they should be shunned. So it's kind of like the time frame that you could see this officer going through. And let's just say they have between five and seven years on already. Oh, they're not a, they're not a, broken for forever and that's why i like the car analogy this car is going through the blizzard the windshield wipers aren't working anymore one of the lights is out you got a flat tire yeah it's in shitty condition it can barely move on the highway does that mean the car needs to be totaled no all those things can be fixed and so i, I don't think for the majority of people, you know, right now, the current paradigm in the mental health field is we're going to put you on med for that. This officer's overwhelmed, got severe depression. A lot of clinicians are going to think he's got a chemical imbalance in his head. So we need to treat it with a pill. And unfortunately, the outcome data for the pills is not very good. Is with the first pill they give you, there's only a 30% chance that you're not going to be depressed anymore. Only 30% chance. 70% chance that your depression is still going to be lingering two, three months from now. And that's gonna make this psychiatrists, psychologists be like, you know, well, you're still depressed. You're not ready to go back. You're not ready to go back on duty. And, uh, and, and that can just keep going. That is the standard of care. Unfortunately, I can't change that standard of care. So I'm gonna, I, I gotta give you that real answer. That's the real answer. The new answer that I wanna offer people is if, if this person now has desk duty, we've got a shot. We're going to do repair work. It's like this we're going to take this car into the shop, going to change the fucking tire. We're going to put on some new windshield wipers. 
or maybe even get an upgrade a little. <laughs> like this, this, this car is going back into the blizzard. All right, we can, we can manage, we can manage, but we're gonna maybe add some snow tires. We're gonna maybe put some chains on. Even we're, we're gonna, we're gonna buff this car up, get it going, so that it can survive. Um, and. Based on my clinical get, get, work, getting me pumped up, getting me going right now, Doc. <laughs> based Let's on do it. my clinical work, and you know, and stories like yours, Frank. I mean, I actually think, you know, if we've got four weeks, let's say we've got four to six weeks, person's on desk duty, pressure's on, wants to go back to his job, but needs to be in better shape. I'm going to talk about we're changing your diet a lot. Zero alcohol, zero marijuana, zero anything that is harming your metabolism. Zero. The person tells me, no, I ain't doing that. I'm going to be like, okay, well, but you, you want your job? How, how bad do you want it? Really? Like, how bad do you want your job? We've got four to six weeks to get you in better shape. And what I'm telling you is every drink of, every sip of alcohol is harming your metabolism, it's harming your brain. And your brain is failing right now. It is not okay right now. So it, you know, even if you could have tolerated drinking, you know, a year ago, you can't tolerate it anymore. You are in bad shape. So we need to leave it alone. And um. Super strict sleep schedule. Go to bed same time every night. We're going to try to get you decent sleep. I'm going to have this person get bright light exposure in the morning. I'm going to be, we're going to be hydrating. We're going to be talking about exercise plan. We're going to be buffing that up. Um, with all of those things in place, is it going to be 100% of people who are better? No not but i actually firmly believe it's going to be a lot better than that 30 percent chance with the antidepressant they're going to give you you're you're going to have a lot better chance of being recovered four to six weeks than the antidepressant is going to give you and i'm not making the 30 percent thing up it, that's a real statistic unfortunately only 30 percent chance your depression is going to be gone called remission um so uh but am i going to be using psychotherapy possibly absolutely am i going to be using mindfulness and stress reduction practices absolutely so i mean tons of tools in the toolkit but again i'm i'm picture this car this car is beaten down it's got a lot of things wrong with it yeah we're going to change the windshield wipers and the tires and put on new tires and chains and we're gonna maybe change the battery and we're gonna do all sorts of things and you're gonna say does this car really need all of that and i'm gonna say well this if this car wants to go back out in that blizzard yeah let's go ahead and just buff it up as much as we can and that's why i'm going to use all these types of strategies with this officer if this officer is like i'm beaten down but i want to go back then I'm going to say we need to buff you up and fast. Thank you. There is a reason behind my madness. Um, and I really hope you guys somehow, you know, get this, this, this talk in front of, you know, whoever's in your department, right? I'm very lucky to be a peer support member in my department. And I'm lucky that we have a peer support team. Not a lot of departments have that. Um, and and I, I, I really do believe that the shift is, is changing. Um, and I just hope uh, the day that I retire is that I just left it better than it was um, when I left. And that I really believe that the law enforcement first responder mental health field is changing slowly but surely. But we all need to be this together. And we, we have a fierce leader right in front of us. So thank you, Dr. Palmer. This is going to be my last question. It's going to be a touchy topic. Um, and I, I, I guess I consider myself, I've never really said this uh, live, um, a survivor of this of suicide because uh it was in a dark place some big time suicidal ideations uh lost my my own uncle to to um to suicide so the topic is going to be suicide um and my pd 
already lost two officers this year to suicide in the month of January. And I saw that four Chicago police officers took their own lives within a month. Um, 2019, 10 at New York City police, uh, two, 10 NYPD officers lost their lives to suicide, 2019 alone. Um, a lot of cops in the locker room, the, you know, I don't want to say the way I got a word, I'd be careful is, uh, tend to blame the job. The cop took his life because of the overtime. The personnel is short. The job did this. The pay is not high enough. He's overworked. He's burnt out. Um, but as we know, as I know, you talk about in your book is that this is a very complex issue, mental illness. It's not just biological or psychological we have environmental as well right um those are definitely what i just named is definitely high stress i mean we just spoke about it for the past 30 minutes about this job being stressed and you basically said you know which was i don't know laughing but you're seeing all this stuff and yeah, yeah i guess you do have the right to be a little depressed and and saying i'm seeing all these negative things all the time so the perception of getting help and the stress of the job, uh, metabolically on our brain and our body, uh, you know, that might take, bring out, this job might bring out deep rooted issues that we've never faced before in our past. And like you spoke about in our childhood, um, I talked about the, the Minotaur, Serbius is three headed dog. What are some tips to everyone in this group that everyone is listening uh, the takeaway for suicide prevention. Uh, is there really one factor for suicide that's always out there and, and people think that, and that's the kind of question I want to get to is the tips. And can we even say that there's one factor? Oh, you know, obviously this is a really complicated topic and there are lots of reasons people end up committing suicide. Most of them are life issue, um, life issues, but sometimes people can have suicidal thoughts in response to medications, psychiatric medications. It's right on the package insert, actually, for some psych meds, that this medication might induce suicidal and behaviors. So, um, so it gets really complex really fast but without getting into that the bio biological aspects of it i want to break suicide into kind of three three big bucket reasons why people consider suicide there are more than this it's not, nothing's ever simple as three buckets but i'm going to put it into three buckets because i think there are three big buckets one reason people consider suicide is because of unrelenting pain or suffering. They have a chronic mental illness. They have um, horrible debilitating pain. The doctors can't do anything about it. They have a horrible you know, degenerative illness, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, something like that. And they don't see any way out of their suffering or pain. Um, and they think suicide is like, I can't tolerate my life anymore. It's just misery constantly. And the doctors can't do anything for me. And so I may as well be dead. I'd rather just die than live like this. The second bucket is um, it's really about shame and guilt all sorts of things can induce shame and guilt in human beings um committing a crime betraying somebody uh, uh making a mistake that had fatal consequences for someone else um obviously you all are at much higher risk for these things but like i know a woman who was tormented she backed out of her driveway and ran over her child, killed her child, could not forgive herself, just could not forgive herself. Um, so shame and guilt uh, can, can do it. 
And the third bucket is losing some a significant part of your purpose in life. So that could be losing a significant relationship in your life. It's really a big part of your life. Your spouse is going to divorce you. Um, that could be losing your job. That could be you know, betting large on cryptocurrency and losing it all. Your purpose in life, all of those relate to your purpose in life. You're supposed to have relationships. You're supposed to be responsible. You're supposed to take care of yourself, pay your bills, have a job, have something useful to do with yourself. And when people lose any of those things, especially when it's a dramatic loss of those things, especially if the person doesn't have any control over the loss of those things, it was unexpected. They can often consider suicide in response to that. So I think one of the first steps is to actually simply share that information with people. And then say, if you're thinking about hurting yourself, which one do you fall in? Because now I'm trying to make it more objective. So if I say that message and any of you are even slightly thinking about suicide, you're gonna think he's making this all objective, like it's like there's like it's a solvable problem. Like, how the hell did he know? How did he know that, yeah, I guess I fall into that. Oh, and now he says it that way. That so, seems so obvious. Yeah. But it is. It, the people will still usually say, well, whatever, but it's still unsolvable. It's still unsolvable. And some of those situations are going to be unsolvable. You have chronic pain. You have ALS. Doctors can't heal it. Well, guess what? They're not going to be able to heal it. Um, your wife is leaving you. You don't want that. You don't like that. She doesn't give a shit. She's leaving you. She's made her, she made her decision. She's out of here. You don't get control over that decision. Um, you lost all your money on a, on a gamble. Well, that, it ain't coming back. But what I'll say is that the overwhelming majority of those situations, even the ones that involve chronic suffering, the overwhelming majority of those situations are temporary. They are not permanent lifelong state. So yeah, you may be losing your wife. Yeah, maybe you lost all your money, but you can recover. You can recover from that. And I think helping people understand, you know, I think that the two most important steps in suicide prevention, you know somebody and you're worried that maybe they're thinking about suicide. I guess I would say the two most important steps are number one, honor them enough to state reality and let them talk about reality and let them talk about how shitty this thing is, how unfair it is, how devastating it is. Don't tell them it's going to be okay. Don't tell them they shouldn't worry about it. Don't tell them, you know, oh, come on, buddy. You, Oh, big deal. She's a bitch. You know, your wife is leaving you. She's a bitch. You can, you can find somebody else. That's not helping him because that's actually making him feel ashamed for feeling the way he feels. You're, you're kind of, number one, you're shaming him. That's not helping the suicidal person, I can tell you that. Number two, you're telling them you don't want to hear it. You can't, you don't want to hear it. You don't want to hear how bad it is. You don't, you're not interested in listening to him. And now, now he's isolated even more. Now he's shamed even more. Because other people can deal with their wives leaving them. Why can't I? Um, but I can't. I can't. I just don't know how I'm going to move on. So somebody has to help 
know, in the psychological field, we call this validation. I have to validate this person's feeling. And that means honor them and respect them or her enough to let them talk about how shitty it is. Don't sugarcoat it for them. All you got to do is just listen and let them talk. You want to throw any words in, throw in like, oh my fucking God, how are you dealing with that? Wow, I got, God, I don't know how you're dealing with that. That sucks. Um, Make it be authentic. Don't do anything phony. If that, too phony. if that sounds phony to you, don't do it. Make it authentic. Let it be real and let it, you know, people are afraid to do that. That's why I'm going out of my way to say and to encourage you to do this. People are afraid to do it because they're afraid. Shit, I can't tell him it's shitty because then he'll really off himself. No, telling him that's really shitty is going to save him because you're actually letting him connect with you. You're, you're going to that shitty hell place he's in. And now he doesn't feel alone anymore. Now he feels like, oh my God, you really get it? Like you're, and you're willing to like, listen to me say this and you get it? That's great. You have to do that first part. First part is required. You have to let him do a little of that. You're not going to let him go on and on though for hours. And you're not going to leave him with that being the last word. Let me be clear. This is where it gets tricky and nuanced. That is not the last word of the conversation. Let him go on for a few minutes, five minutes. He really needs to go on for a half an hour. Let him go on for a half an hour. Let him cry. Let him scream. Let him yell. Let him swear. Let him do whatever he needs to do. Tell you how shitty his life is. How he's given up. How he doesn't have any hope. But then you have to insert. And yet, I know you can get through this. And yet, I know you can have a better life. Yeah, this is shitty. Yeah, you're going through hell right now. And I know you. You're smart. You're kind. You're brave. You're whatever. Again, don't make it up. Don't say phony shit. Say real stuff. But tell that person something redeeming about themselves and why they should stay alive, like why that matters, why they should stay around, and how that can help them get through it and move to an, a better place. Um, I think those would be the two universal tips I would give. Amen. Thank you. I can't really have the words after that. So, uh, Dr. Palmer, um, thank you so much. Uh, Thank you for sharing your strengths, experience, and hope tonight uh, with the group, um, with Retro Responders as a family. Um, we have a few, uh, we have some time for a few questions, if that's okay with you. I know we're a little over, but sure. still majority yeah, of the group is me. here. Um, all right, guys. So just like a normal responder talk, just raise your hand. I'll call on you. Uh, introduce yourself. Any questions, uh, Any anything you heard that I said or Dr. Palmer said uh, that you can relate with, or maybe there's just something that you want to get off your chest here. Uh, about your week is going well or it's not going well um this is it this is the safe haven for us so um who's gonna bet? there he is uh oh when christina was jumping in joe you see that uh giuseppe now batting joseph lanzoni joseph lanzoni thank you so much um mrs vos uh, i'm not going to take too long um, so I, cause I really want to hear you, uh, but first, um, Dr. Palmer, um, <clears throat> I've, uh, I, I am uh, a volunteer for reps for responders. I am a responder to responders. I'm not a first responder. Um, I've been with reps from the beginning. Um, I'm an addiction and trauma specialist in private practice, uh, in Nyack, New York. And I also, uh, two years ago, retired from 20 years as a professor at Fordham University Graduate School of Clinical Social Work uh, at Lincoln Center in Manhattan. Um, among the things that um, 
that have been popping up in my mind as as you've so beautifully shared uh, is a big concern of mine, which which is for responders of first responders in terms of uh, specifically around tra trauma issues. How we can we can uh, get into a lot of vicarious trauma. Uh, and so many of the people that I know, either locally, who are doing the same kind of work that I do, um, don't seem to um, don't seem to want to share too much, except for you know we are we are miracle workers. We have done so much, you know we're so successful um, through a lot of avenues, including you know the including your profession and through in, including psychiatry, in terms of referring and encouraging people in terms of medication, et cetera. Um, I, a long time ago, and I'm not bragging about this, a long time ago, uh, I, through, through, through my own personal experiences in terms of recovery, um, I started to you know, re retailer my, anything that I could do in terms of my own healing. Um, along with therapy in terms of exercise and nutrition and spirituality, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I, I have very, very thankfully lived with the results of that. Um, and with, within, you know, professional boundaries, et cetera, I've never had any problems sharing that with any patient of mine um, for, the, for the very same reasons. It, it, it's so refreshing to hear you. Um, I recently ingested your book, um, but I have not digested it yet. So uh, you you kind of got the juices flowing tonight by just being here. Um, what you just closed with, I had a number of questions, but they're not nearly as, as important as what I want to say to you specifically. What you just shared with in terms of being honest, being authentic, um, Sharing a person's suffering as opposed to telling them, oh, it's not, you know, it's not that bad. You know, we immediately had the bomb for it before we even know how deep, you know, the, the, the rash is. Uh, joining, joining people in their suffering, um, encouraging them through, through, through the honesty that you, you just discussed. Um, this program, from my perspective, Reps for Responders, is all about being honest um, with each other. Uh, that, takes, that takes a lot of guts for most people. Um, and pooling together resources um, that are not just one track. Um, the, the specific tracks that you've mentioned in terms of uh, the intersection between addiction, mental illness, et cetera, et cetera, um, for all the right reasons. Um, so I just, once again, I... I Really, really appreciate this time. And Frank, I have to thank you very, very much for getting Dr. Palmer here. I, I appreciate this greatly. Well, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for doing the work you're doing. You're here to support all of them. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you, Joseph. Much appreciated, as we call him, the Master Yoda. Um, Christina, you were up and now you're up for good so uh welcome hi thanks frank um and thank you dr palmer and um joe actually you you touched on what i wanted to just highlight too is dr palmer your closing statement about letting people who are in pain vent um that really and, and i use vent in, in a good way um that really struck me i think that sitting in the in the trenches with people is something that's really hard um and we the first thing we do want to say is like it's going to be okay like you're going to be fine and the fact of the matter is like we don't we don't know that and when when we try to pr put that on to people i have found that in my i'll speak for myself that it's because the way that they're feeling is making me uncomfortable and i i want that to go away so i try to put like, you know, it's, you're going to be fine. You're going to be okay. Um, and it's almost like this toxic positivity in a sense too. Um, and I've been learning in the work that I do. So I, I am Frank's other half. I do health coaching 
with partners of addiction and recovery. And sometimes they just want to be heard. They just want to be seen. They just want someone to sit with them and listen to them because they are in so much pain. And the best responses that I've gotten when I've moved away from the, it's going to be okay, because I don't know that, is just letting them talk and hearing them and seeing them and saying, that sounds really difficult. That That's a lot. That's, that's overwhelming. Like, I, I hear that that's really hard for you and that you're struggling with this. And when I lead like that, when I lead with that compassion and that kind of empathy, it, something in them is like, oh, like, like I'm not being overdramatic and I'm not, I'm not being too much because my partner tells me that I'm overdramatic and that I'm too much and that I'm overreacting and really sitting in the trenches with them for whether it's five minutes or 30 minutes sometimes it lets them know that they're not alone. And I love what you said about, um, you know, reminding, remind them of their strength because in those moments they've forgotten like everything negative in their life is all consuming at that point. And that's, that's what's beating down the door for them. And they forget that there's this inner strength that they possess and that there's so many amazing things about them and to be able to say, yeah, this fucking sucks. And this is hard. And you are strong and you will get through this. And, and here are some ways that I will, like, I'll sit with you. I'll be with you through this. It's, it's, I don't know if it'll be okay, but you're not alone. And I think that's the most important thing is letting people know that they're not alone. So I just wanted to highlight that because you put into words what I have been trying to practice and it's just such a good reminder. So I'll end there, but you just really validated something for me. Um, so that I'll end with that. So thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Thank you for doing the work you're doing too. Sounds like you knew what you were doing all along. And I just, I just reiterated it and you're like, yeah, that is what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I think it's just such an important thing to highlight because like right. I said, we, we tend to just say, no, you're going to be fine. And it's just like a knee jerk reaction. And we just need to take a breath and sit back and, you know, r respond differently. And then sometimes the outcome can be different. I agree. I agree. Yeah, no, I think, you know, Frank was talking about, you know, going uh, down in the depths of hell or in the basement or whatever. You think of people being trapped down a well. You can't just yell down to them. Come on up. It's not so bad. <laughs> you actually have to go down in the well with them. Say, wow, it really sucks here. And then when you end it with, and yet I can get out of it. Even though you're not helping them get out of it at that moment, you're modeling for them, I can be here with you in the depths of hell, and I can still remember that you're a good, decent, smart, strong person, and there's a future for you, even though we're in hell right now. And you're letting them see that there's a path out of that hell if you just sat with them in hell they really felt connected to you they knew you were there with them and then you got out that's what you have to end with you got out because if you if you just end with the wallowing you're leaving them in hell without any hope without any glimmer of hope thank you thank you dr palmer thank you uh christina she says my better half uh, and you can see that uh, she did not leave me in the well. Almost, though. Almost. I would have to pull some Spider-Man moves or call my man Giuseppe. Um, <laughs> we'll go to uh, Aaron. Uh, welcome, man, to uh, First Responder Talk. Hope to see you coming back. And the floor is yours, man. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm from St. Paul area. I'm a cop in Egan. I'm just south of St. Paul. And uh, Dr. Palmer, thank you. I really enjoyed your book. And sorry, my kids are coming in. So that would be a little loud. They're getting out now. No um, my question is regarding critical incidents. Every year we have usually one or two, whether it's, you know, a death of a child, uh, like a baby or officer involved shooting. These big stressful events happen. And often what happens is officers are isolated from their community, uh, especially officer involved shooting. I'll just take that as an example. 
Do you have anything uh, on a metabolic level as kind of like a toolkit or protocol if you're involved in a critical incident like an officer involved shooting? I know there's sometimes uh, fasting protocols when people have brain injuries or concussions or things like that. Would you recommend anything in particular if someone goes through an extremely stressful event that's going to continue on for weeks on end? You know, the I hate to say this, every situation is going to be different, but I'll give you some framework. So I have to couch it with these frameworks may not apply to every situation. But um, the, the first framework, the first thing I would say is that the primary insult is psychological. This person is going to be terrified. This person is going to be either consumed with guilt and shame because of something related to the event or this person is going to be terrified about losing a significant purpose in life. If they're worried about losing their job, if they're worried about, um, you know, disappointing um, uh, colleagues, um, that's the first thing that needs to be addressed. Somebody from, somebody, whether it's somebody from the force, somebody from their immediate family, somebody here who knows who they are, somebody needs to reach out to them and do what I just talked about with the suicide prevention. Let them talk about what they're going through. Go down in the well with them. Let them scream, shout, let them cry. Let them talk about their guilt and shame. Let them, you know, talk about whatever. If you're really suspecting there's tons of guilt and shame and they're not letting it out, give them permission to talk about it. What are you thinking about? What are you feeling? What, what's going on for you? Do you think you did something wrong? Um, and so give them permission to talk about it. And then again, end with, and there's a way out of this for you. You did everything you could. You were in a horrible situation. You did the best you could do with what you had. And that's all any of us can do. And now we got to make sure this doesn't take you down. Um, so if, if it's really abrupt kind of if, it, if it's an abrupt threat to the person's livelihood or honor or reputation, I mean, I know you brought up a lot of different scenarios that may not have anything to do with that, but let's use that because that's probably one of the worst scenarios. That person might be thinking about suicide. Like I'm shamed, honored, I'm, I'm on leave, I'm, there, you know, I might lose my job. Uh, this is in the papers. People are talking shit about me. Um, people hate me. Now my fellow officers hate me because they, you know, I'm people are not liking cops right now um, because of something that happened, because of something I did, supposedly. They don't understand what happened. They weren't there. Um, it's important to give this person a chance to talk about it. And again, the fear, I just need to reiterate. The fear for everyone. I used to have this fear. When I first became a mental health professional, I had this fear, just like so many other people. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just going to push them over the edge. They're going to like kill themselves. If I like, I'm not going to ask them, are you thinking about killing yourself? Or are you feeling ashamed? Like, do you think you did anything wrong? It's just like throwing salt on the wound. I can't be doing that. Um, I can tell you now, after 27 plus years of doing this work, that is the best favor you can do for them. It is the best favor you can do for them. It takes a lot of work. Like Christina was saying, it can, it can suck to be you. you. Have to listen to this and to not, and to just have to tolerate listening to them and their depths of despair. Um, but 
I think if you can do that, again, always with the caveat that you're going to end, you're going to show them there's a way out of this. There's a way out of this. And I can get out of it right now. I'm modeling that for you because yours, even though we're, I'm here with you, we're stuck in this well, but I'm going to show you there's a way out. And no matter what happens, your life is going to go on and you have so much to offer this world. And then in terms of, you know, the most important thing, probably more than diet, um, the, the, the next most important thing after kind of a psychological debrief is sleep. The most likely thing that's going to happen is this person's not going to be sleeping because they're going to be tormented with thoughts and guilt and worry and, you know, what's going on, why. And, and so stressing to this person, sleep is of utmost importance because uh, if they let their sleep get off, it can be a downward spiral and things can spiral out of control very quickly. So sleep is the next thing. I would definitely talk with them about avoiding the bad coping strategies. So as, as, as I'm saying this, the theme that I'm hearing myself say, which I'll just articulate out loud, is it's not so much about we're going to change your diet because you must have been following a bad diet and now it's now in the middle of this chaos and, and stress, we're going to change your diet. It's not that. The biggest, most imperative thing is to recognize shit, you're falling down a well right now. And you are going to be tempted and or push to have things happen. You're not going to sleep well. You're going to be up ruminating all night. You're going to get on the computer and look at the news in the middle of the night. You're going to be obsessing about whatever. Now you're going to be drinking. You're going to drink more. You're going to smoke weed to try to stop the thought. You're going to drink to try to sleep. You're you're. Now you're doing all of these things, not sleeping, using excess alcohol, drugs, all this, you know, obsessing, ruminating. We're going to try to stop these things that are going to push this person over the ledge. This person's life is not going to be happy. There's no way around that. I mean, you've got an abrupt situation, you know, a horrible situation an abrupt threat to your profession, possibly tainted with guilt, shame, whatever. There's no way around it. This person is not going to be happy. Um, just acknowledging that with that person, sitting with them, like, of course, you're just like, how could you not be? Like, of course. Um, so it's really more about mitigating the damage um, I wouldn't be opposed to a diet change. Sure, first of all, to try a low carb diet or paleo diet or keto or something else. Sure, why not? I'm, we're not gonna. I'm not gonna say no to it. That, those aren't the. That's not the first thing I'm thinking of in this situation. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you, uh, Dr. Palmer. Appreciate it. Um, now we'll go next to Andrew. Welcome. My friend, uh, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Frank, for putting this on. Uh, I actually found this just by doing a, uh, a search on Instagram for Dr. Palmer. And then, uh, you know, luckily I found this. So uh, I'm fortunate to be here. And thanks for putting this on. Dr. Palmer, thanks for being here. And, you know, thanks for everyone for uh, attending. Uh, you know, my name is Andrew, and I'm the senior enlisted medical advisor for uh, Special Forces Battalion in Okinawa. And we're trying to do, um, well, I'm doing a, what I'll call a qualitative improvement study for some of the guys that um, it started out for people who wanted to quit drinking. You know, I'm in recovery myself, so I've kind of been the uh, go-to uh, guy here for, you know, trying to stop drinking for some of the guys and, you know, just advice for them as well. Um, 
so we tried to do the keto diet and follow some of the guides that you had put up from your research uh, that I found last year. And then we kind of got it started in January at the new year to, you know, improve people's um, time for, you know, that type of a thing with resolutions and whatnot. Um, and so it started out with alcohol and that's what I wanted to do, but I've, I've had a lot of people and that I know <laughs> that have alcohol problems, but they don't want to uh, admit it to themselves yet. So we're still working on that with them, um, trying to get them to, you know, come to the study, come and talk, um, et cetera. But what I have found is uh, giving them like PCL fives and some other um, psychological tests to see where they are with their depression, anxiety, um, PTSD, uh, things of that nature. I've noted that there have been quite a few people with depression and or PTSD. And so um, what, what I found is a lot of these guys hadn't gone and talked to our battalion psychologist or any mental health professionals because, you know, the stigma associated with it, um, you know, clearances, losing their guns, like, you know, the police officers, um, or they don't want to do drugs because then they're uh, non-deployable and things of that nature. Um, and so I'm looking for some recommendations from you, um, like on levels of ketones. I, I know that 0.8 that you've said uh, previously, 0.8 to 1.5 is like the therapeutic threshold that you're looking for, um, for depression or more serious um, uh, mental illnesses like uh, schizophrenia, you know, we don't have any of that. It's more of just like depression um, associated with mostly PTSD. Um, and then one, uh, I had a question about two high levels of ketones. I had somebody come in and they had 4.7 and then 5.2 uh, on their, and we do the blood, um, the blood monitor. And, I, you know, I, I looked it up and it was like, you know, uh, notify your doctor immediately. And so <laughs> I, re I reached out to our, uh, our family doc here and, you know, she was like, uh, you know, just have him go eat something and, um, uh, try to lower his levels down. And then he was fine. But, um, uh, yeah, so I'm just kind of looking for some recommendations and guidance, uh, on like, because the, the end result for this study is to go to our medical association, present what we've found in the study without getting, you know, because we haven't gotten any approvals to do this. So it's just me basically doing it with um, um, the volunteers and then getting the data from them um, and then going to this medical conference, presenting our data and trying to get um, more groups on board. Um, there's, you know, different groups throughout the country and then have everyone come together to actually do a uh, funded research project wow. throughout, you know, uh, use of soccer, something like that. That's awesome. So, so your question is about the levels of ketones or? Uh, yeah, the, um, the levels of ketones and then um, what recommendations you have as far as, you know, research that you've come across. I, I've seen a lot of your research um, or places to look for um, uh, guidance and um, um, go to go to sources for information uh, to be able to use, you know, moving forward. You know, I, I have your book. Um, and I use that and then a lot of your research I found on your website um, and using that. I don't know if you have any other recommendations or, you know, ways forward that I should progress. We do. So there, um, the, so my book, unfortunately, is not going to give you a lot of specifics on the ketogenic diet. My book is really about kind of the metabolic theory and mental illness. The, the, if you're looking to specifically use the ketogenic diet as a therapeutic for mental um, mental health, I would I would strongly recommend a book, Ketogenic Diet Therapies, um, by Eric Kosoff, K O S S O F F. You can order it on Amazon. It's available other places. So that that book 
is written primarily for using the ketogenic diet and epilepsy, but it is highly applicable to people with mental disorders because we use epilepsy treatments all the time in mental disorders. So I really look at it that way. And there are lots of other resources in terms of weight loss or in terms of type 2 diabetes or even type 1 diabetes, many other resources for those. But that would probably be my go-to resource for that because that is focused on using the ketogenic diet for a brain disorder or brain disorders. Um, as a rule of thumb, I go for low, if, if you're treating depression and PTSD, I would go for blood levels greater than 0 0.8, as you said. If they have severe symptoms, if they have anything bordering on a psychotic symptom or severe obsessive symptoms, I'd probably go for a little higher, probably greater than 1. Point, you know, ideally greater than 1.5, somewhere between 1.5 and 5 person that you mentioned who had four to five um usually i'm gonna i'm gonna focus on symptoms with that person if ketones are getting too high and five is starting to get too high for some people i've had some people who run three to five on a regular basis and that's actually their optimum range those are patients usually with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia but it, it is what it is that, but what you'll know, if the ketones become too high, the people will feel sick. They will say, I feel weak, dizzy. They'll actually lose their appetite and they'll start to become nauseous. And it can actually be difficult for them to then eat. If that should happen, just as a rule of thumb, that that should happen. Um, if you have something like apple juice or orange juice, I usually, now pay attention, one tiny teaspoon or tablespoonful, that's it. Have them drink one teaspoon or tablespoonful. That will bring their ketones, so they're not drinking a big glass of it, but that will bring their ketones down usually enough repeat after you know 30 minutes if it doesn't and the way that you'll know the ketones are coming down is the person will start feeling better the person will start saying oh i'm not nauseous anymore the nausea's gone um and and that's okay um usually if they don't have nausea i think like the your uh doc said i would usually just have them eat some protein um go out eat some protein and that will usually bring their levels down um, a little more normal. But they're, if they're not having symptoms, it, five isn't concerning. And much above five, I would be concerned. And usually it, it's going to be obvious. So step one, you're shooting for these ketones greater than that level. The majority of people will get an antidepressant effect within two to four weeks. But I have had some patients that it takes two to three months. Um, and interestingly, that's kind of the time course for a lot of antidepressants and other psychiatric medications. Sometimes they don't work in two to four weeks. They take longer to work. Um, so I would encourage you to be patient. The, the next piece of advice is I would try your best. I don't know what diet these people are eating, the more you can eat real whole foods, the better. So, you know, all sorts of, um, all sorts of places have keto, you know, snacks and ice cream bars and chocolate chip cookies and all these other things. And all of those are loaded with a lot of fake things, fake ingredients. And the reason for my caution on those is because I've had patients who have been doing extraordinarily well. One patient in particular, his psychosis was gone. He was stable on a whole food ketogenic diet. He came across some quote unquote keto chocolate bars, said keto right on the label, 
he ate an entire chocolate bar thinking that he was fine because it says keto and he became floridly psychotic as a result um and came in kind of saying the next day like i need to be in the hospital actually and this is somebody who did not like being in the hospital and he was like i need to be in the hospital this treatment's not working i can't take this um i measured his ketones they were they were they had plummeted they were essentially negative and I, so I was like, what the hell is going on? You're not doing the diet. And he's, no, I am doing the diet. We fought back and forth and finally problem solved and figured out what it was. Um, and got him back into ketosis and he was fine. Um, so avoided the hospitalization and everything else. I think those would be my general strategies. So target levels, try to eat real whole foods as much as possible. Um, and then give it enough time to actually work. And the most important thing with these people is to inform them that this may not work right away. It's not like you do the keto diet for a week and then you're cured. It, it's going to take some time, just like a medication is going to take some time. I would, I want to caution, if you haven't heard me say this before, look out for hypomania. A lot of people within the first two to three weeks, we'll get hypomanic. Most people don't know it. Tons of people in the keto community, you can like see it online all the time. They're just doing the diet for weight loss. And they're talking about how they've got keto clarity. And oh my God, I've never felt this good in my entire life. This is wonderful. I feel invincible. And I'm like, yeah, you're hypomanic. <laughs> they don't know what it is. A lot of, a lot of people don't seem to know what it is. It's hypomania. For most people, it's not necessarily a significant problem. It usually levels out and they, they feel great for a time and that's fine. But for the, if you're working with people who have chronic mental disorders, they're all at higher risk for that hypomania turning into mania um, because they've already got a brain disorder, so to speak. So their brain is already their brain is already vulnerable, and so that hypomania, you know, in somebody just losing weight may not be a big deal, but the hypomania in somebody with a brain disorder can turn into a, a big deal. And the treatment for that is sleep. Um, sleep, what, however, it needs to happen. So usually, just education will be enough. Um, if they if they can't sleep, maybe try over-the-counter supplements like melatonin or something like that. See if that can get them to sleep. You're not adding these things permanently. You're just adding them for a few days, two, three days, just to get them some sleep two or three days in a row. And then they can usually stop the supplement and then they're off the prices. Um, in the patients that I work with, sometimes I do have to prescribe uh, prescription strength sleeping pills. Um, to avoid, you know, a manic episode, but uh, hopefully you won't run into that. Thank you, Andrew. I uh, hope to see you and Aaron back. Uh, same information every Sunday night. Um, I don't think Dr. Palmer will be here every single night, but, uh, you know, <laughs> but uh, no, thank you, Dr. Palmer, for another amazing detailed uh, explanation there. Uh, one last question, and then we wrap it up, if that's okay with you, Dr. Palmer. It's uh, sure. We're way over time here, so thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, got a message from Omar, our friend over there. He's on his phone, couldn't raise his hand, but Omar, uh, the floor is yours, my brother, and uh, hopefully uh, you're still here with us. Hey, Frank, can you hear me? Yes, sir, you're on the air. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm playing pickleball in a tournament here. Um, so, Doc, thank you for being on. I was listening to you as I was playing with my headphone, like you have yours. Amazing technology. Uh, I'm fat. I'm, I'm out of breath. Sorry about that. I'm hearing about keto. I'm hungry. Oh, man. Anyway, my question is, I've been sober for over 200 days now. Um, I am picking up more of the alcohol-free beer. Um, like Heineken Zero, what do you 
recommend that for a long-term uh, remedy or even the, or, the, or what are your advantages or what are the advantages and what are disadvantages? So I would say the advantage is if that's what it takes for you to not drink right now, great. Any, any, any strategy that helps you not drink right now is a good one. Over time, I'm going to say drinking alcohol-free beer is reminding you all the time about how much you like beer. Every time you drink that alcohol-free beer, you are staying, you're keeping connected with that addiction. And you're not putting it away completely. And although I fully understand, you may feel like I kind of can't give it. I just, I don't know. I just need the taste. I just, I just need something. Um, I will say that if you can get through, you know, at least in the work that I do, comes in stages for a lot of people and everybody's different. Somewhere in the three to six month mark, it's usually not before three months, but somewhere in the three to six month mark, if you can go without it for three to six months, your cravings for it will really legitimately start to go away. And then the longer you can stay away from it, you can get to a point where you can be around other people even who might be drinking right in front of you. And you can think, I don't want that. That's not for me anymore. Um, but so as a rule of thumb, I discourage people from drinking things that are going to remind them of drinking, drinking things that taste like what they used to drink. This would go for even somebody who drinks mixed drinks. Like if somebody's beverage of choice was cosmopolitan, and then they say, oh, I'm having virgin cosmopolitan, I'm just having, you know, I, I would say, why are you doing that to yourself? I mean, you are hooked on cosmopolitan. You need to give those up. The cranberry juice is reminding you of what that tastes like. You don't need that. Like, that's gone. That's that's going to be in your past. Just get rid of it. Sorry if I'm raining on your parade. <laughs> no, I, I I totally respect your your perspective. Um, I I know being out of uh, two hundred over two hundred days, it hasn't been. Um, well, it was. I don't want to say it was difficult, nor was it hard. I've done this before in the past. And I've done it for over a year. And that was probably the peak of my life where uh, I was so much, I was focused on life and everything. Uh, finished my um, undergrad and now I'm back in school with my master's. Um, and I remember when I went two years ago, I wasn't clear, I wasn't thinking clearly. You know, I got a B minus, I got a C in a class and, and two courses. And I started last semester, two courses, and I got two A's. And so I see the big difference of not drinking anymore that's awesome congratulations and congratulations on your 200 days that's amazing keep it up you can do it thanks doc i appreciate it and i'm gonna read your book um i've been here and everybody's been reading it i felt like it was an assignment <laughs> and i failed to read it no it was not no it was not so thank you omar uh hope you bring back that trophy on the pickleball court um, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Palmer, uh, just thank you so much for a wonderful responder talk tonight, for being here, for, uh, really just being, a, a wonderful human being, um, and supporting us. I mean, I, I really, I do believe it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to be here and, and here and able to ask you questions and listen to you live. So, um, before we close out, if you have any last comments or anything you want to say uh, but we just really appreciate you well i i i actually really sincerely mean this i appreciate all of you guys 
you guys are fucking going through hell and the blizzard and all that. I'm living the good life compared to you. So thank you all for doing what you're doing. And if I can be a little bit of a service repair shop and help change a tire or put on a new windshield wiper blade or something for you guys, or, you know, buff you up a little bit to keep you going, I'm more than happy to do it. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I feel uh, feel like I just got a nice new car wash ready. Uh, tomorrow's my Friday, so I'll be <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be ready. Um, so with that, everybody, thank you so much. We have a nice way of closing. Uh, just a moment of silence for all the sick and suffering on the screen uh, who who's in a car tonight, who's sitting at desk duty, uh, who was not able to make this call tonight. So just a moment of silence. Followed by the serenity prayer. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Everyone bring your rope to work tomorrow. Get ready to climb down the well and uh, help a lot of people out of the well. Dr. Palmer, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you and uh, Brain Energy for Life. Hashtag it, put it all around, and God bless, win, what's important now. Good night, everybody. Thank you.